Gresham College presents The Lost Hospitals of London, The Bethlehem Hospital by Colin S. Gale, Bethlehem Royal Hospital. Well, thank you very much, for your, Professor Cox, for your comments and for your welcome. And uh, yes, I was going to start just by saying, though I'm delighted, of course, and honoured to be contributing to Gresham College's series of lectures on the Lost Hospitals of London, uh, of course, I have to tell you that in commuting up from the hospital this morning, I've left behind hundreds of staff and patients who would be rather perplexed to learn that the hospital is lost. Uh, like two of the other five royal hospitals of London, Bridewell's, uh, Bridewell and Christ's, it's certainly no, no longer located in or near the square mile, but unless you believe that one is never more lost than in the, when in the streets of South London, uh, <laughs> Bethlehem is not lost. And it remains to this day, as we've heard, a working psychiatric hospital and part of an NHS Foundation Trust devoted to mental health care. Uh, having first moved south of the Thames in 1815 uh, into a building which now houses the Imperial War Museum, so away from that building that's, uh, that's uh, shown there into the, what is now the Imperial War Museum, and moved again in 1930 to the Beckenham Croydon borders, each time in search of the kind of leafy, open environment which was considered to be most conducive to patients' recovery. Now, I don't intend today to treat these later chapters in the hospital's history in any detail, uh, though of course I'm willing to field questions uh, that anyone may have about them later. Indeed, I'll have a go at answering any questions that are fielded at all. Um, but instead, I've chosen today to focus on Bethlehem's practice of allowing public visiting of its wards with only the loosest of restrictions, but gradually tightening restrictions nevertheless, until 1770. And this self-imposed limitation of focus and of date has the advantage of firmly anchoring Bethlehem within the city. From its foundation in 1247 <coughs> until 1676, Bethlehem was located in Bishopsgate, no trace of it remains today other than the blue plaque on the wall adjacent to Liverpool Street Station. Uh, and then from 1676 to 1815, the hospital was located on the south side of what is today Finsbury Circus. Or in fact, it's a building site, isn't it? Again, no physical trace of it survives except for a blue plaque, this time on the side of a pizza restaurant. Uh, and then by the early 19th century, the building was clearly failing the hospital surveyor having declared original construction to have taken place with inconsiderate zeal and more haste than evident wisdom, <laughs> and rendering its present state, in 1815, incurable. <laughs> it was demolished, and all its fittings, fabric, and masonry, save for two particular items, auctioned off in 1815. The two items saved were Keyes Gabriel Sibber's famous larger-than-life statues of raving and melancholy madness, which reclined atop Bethlehem's entrance gates and had become London, London landmarks. They're now on permanent display in the small archives and museum uh, that's maintained today and open 9.30 to 4.30 weekdays uh, at my hospital, Bethlehem, in Beckenham, where I'm the archivist. So if anything could accurately be described as lost, it's precisely the dominating structure of Bethlehem at Moorfields. Yet the hospital, its iconic statues, and supremely the memory of its role as a visitor attraction of sorts, have maintained a constant profile in the mental landscape of London. For 300 years, the hospital and its inhabitants have provided a set of ready-to-hand metaphors for Variously, the hair-brained excesses, the excruciating poverty, the naked irrationality, the greed and rapaciousness, the hedonism and hypocrisy, and the sadistic and voyeuristic tendencies of contemporary culture. So there's quite a lot there. And these metaphors have precisely not been lost. To give you an initial sense of this, let me cite just two modest examples one 18th century and the other 21st. The first is a passage from an anonymous work of pot-boiling fiction entitled A Description of Bedlam, published in 1722, 
which purports to be an account of what someone saw on a guided tour through the wards of the hospital. It reads, Then turning my eyes to the next cell, my guide said, As yet, there's nobody in this room, but we daily expect a man who lately bore a very considerable figure in the South Sea Company, being no less than one of the late wicked directors. This man, said he, like the rest of his fraternity, set up at an extravagant rate during the late time of distraction, when all the world became a bedlam, and London and Westminster made but one great madhouse. So here's reflected the darkening public mood towards the financiers precipitated by the bursting of the South Sea bubble. <laughs> the author's London is one great madhouse, his or her country having just emerged from a time of distraction. Whether this has any contemporary resonance, I'll leave to your judgment. But my point here is simply that though this passage clearly trades on widely shared public experiences of visiting Bethlehem, it's clearly social commentary rather than factual reportage. Presumably this visit didn't actually happen or didn't happen that way. The rich storehouse of metaphor associated with the hospital continues in use today as my second example will show. Interviewed for the Guardian newspaper in 2009, the TV presenter Michael Parkinson was reported to have said, I object to the exploitation of the underclass in shows like Big Brother. It's the modern version of Bedlam, where you pay to see the poor benighted people making asses of themselves. And this is just one of many examples I could have cited. There's a, a long, a more extended version of this in a, a wonderful article written by Max Pemberton for the Daily Telegraph, making the same comparison between Bethlehem and Big Brother. Remember that show? Um, and I don't have the reference here, but if you put into a search engine the, the terms Pemberton, Big Brother, voyeurism, you'd certainly get it. Whereas unrestrained greed and wild speculation were the target of the first example, prurience and schadenfreude are the target of the second. But in these cases, and many others, the historical memory of Bethlehem frames the discourse, especially as it feeds the metaphor of Bedlam. Noticing this, the historian Keir Waddington has recently commented, apparently much is known about the Bethlehem Royal Hospital and its alter ego, Bedlam. It was one of the sites of London, allegedly admitting an estimated 96,000 visitors a year until 1770. It is common knowledge that the staff were fraudulent and the governors were unaware of what were happening, incapable as they were of running the hospital. <coughs> Bethlehem did not even pretend to care for its patients. These facts have been repeated so often that a historical image have been, has been created of an institution that has come to symbolise all that was mad and bad about the management of the insane. So I think you can sense that there's a lot to uh, unpack and tease out here. And I certainly wouldn't want to deny that, there is any, that there's no truth uh, whatsoever in forming these old chestnuts that uh, Waddington mentions. But the relationship between the memory and the metaphor turns out to be, as one might expect, rather more nuanced than at first sight. So the way I propose to proceed today is as follows. First, we'll trace the measures taken by Bethlehem's incompetent governors uh, in respect of public visiting to give us a structure for understanding what happened when. And then we'll scour first-person, don't worry, I'll do it for you, we'll scour first-person narratives of visits to the hospital to discover what motivated people to visit Bethlehem and what reflections were prompted by their visits to discover whether or not in their terms the hospital was indeed worth a visit. Now I should say at the outset that while the minute books of the Court of Governors of uh, uh, Bethlehem Hospital are held within the archives at Beckenham, I, I haven't read every page of them uh, and I'm grateful in particular to Jonathan Andrews of Newcastle University for having shared with me the fruits of his work on these books in identifying passages from them that have to do with public visiting. So the early, earliest direct mention of public visiting in the minute books of the hospital's Court of Governors then is dated 23rd of March 
1637. When a prohibition is placed on the hospital's employees soliciting or receiving money for their own use from visitors to the hospital. They are charged to bring the porter whatsoever is given in the house or at the door for the benefit of the poor lunatics, and no servant is to beg or require anything of any person coming to Bethlehem to their own uses, but they are to rest contented with their wages, and whatsoever is given there and received by any servant is to be delivered forthwith to the porter and by him to be brought to account. So this is the first of a string of measures designed to ensure that monies given as charitable donations towards the work of the hospital ended up with the hospital and not in the pockets of individual members of staff. The fact that there had to be a string of measures is suggestive of an environment of chaos, corruption and poverty. And uh, even more interesting, I think, than the particular content of this minute is the fact that it's the earliest uh, known mention of public visiting within the Bethlehem Governor's meeting minutes. Here the governors seek to regulate the, the practice of almsgiving within the context of visiting. But nowhere in the minutes is there any record of an original decision to permit it, the, the visiting I mean, in the first place. This omission and the relatively late date of the first minute book entry, when you compare it to the, uh, I guess, the foundation of the hospital uh, four, uh, four centuries previously, has encouraged one historian to question how far back the practice of visiting Bethlehem patients actually stretched. <clears throat> While admitting that many people went to Bethlehem throughout its long history for many reasons, to bring in distracted persons and to take them home when recovered, to visit and provision friends and relatives there, to leave charitable donations, to examine the property or the inhabitants for the City of London's Court of Aldermen, and perhaps to be morally instructed as well, uh, Carol Ann Neely does not, uh, the historian Carol Ann Neely, does not believe that Bethlehem functioned as a spectacle or as tourist attraction before 1632. 1632, by the way, is the date of the publication of the findings of a Privy Council investigation into Bethlehem's financial affairs, which included the detail that money was given at the hospital door by persons who come to see the house. And it's also the date of the publication of an account of conditions at Bethlehem by the clergyman Donald <coughs> Lupton, which I'll refer to later in this lecture. And in particular, uh, Neely disputes that a 1609 reference to a group which included children paying 10 shillings to going, for going to London to see the show of Bethlehem, along with seeing the lions and the fireworks at artillery gardens. She disputes that this reference has anything to do with Bethlehem Hospital. She also considers a 1522 remark by Thomas More uh, that and he writes, Thou shalt in Bedlam see one, see one laughing at the knocking of his own head against a post. And he cites this in support of an argument that not everything we find pleasurable is actually good for us. She considers this reference, as I say, but she, it hasn't occurred to her that this reference and the fact that it could be made carries the implication that some of his readers could, and actually did, visit the hospital to see its patients. And in particular, uh, in respect to the 1609 reference, she thinks that it's implausible that children as young as 8, 11 and 12 would have been taken on a visit to Bethlehem. I'll, I'll say a little bit about children visiting the hospital a little bit later. However, the natural reading of these re references supports the mainstream view, it seems to me, that the practice of indiscriminate visiting at Bethlehem stretches back into at least the 16th century and possibly earlier. The fact that there's no direct mention of the practice in the minutes of the Court of Governors until 1637 doesn't worry me too much. I think it reflects the fact that they didn't, the, the, these Court of Governors didn't govern Bethlehem's affairs at all until the 1570s, and then they were content to govern at arm's length leaving the minutiae of its day-to-day -day administration in the hands of its salaried officers until well into the 17th century. 
And uh, in understanding this, I think we have to step back uh, from our modern perspective. I think we c consider unrestricted hospital visiting to be a highly unusual practice. <laughs> one, one unfit for children, certainly, but also one in which you'd, you'd have to have an extensive justification for it. But perhaps in medieval and early modern times, and I, as I hope to show, the assumption might have been just the opposite. Uh, and maybe what needed accounting for n was not the practice of visiting so much, which could have been given, uh, regarded as a given from time immemorial, but any restriction on this right. Well, we'll come back to that. But the minutes of Bethlehem's Court of Governors give just such an accounting starting in 1637, as I've said, with restrictions on how donations would be given. Let me briefly mention a few other regulations made. In 1677, shortly after the hospital's original relocation from Bishopsgate to Moorfields, the governors ordered that one of the servants in the said hospital do ring the bell there every evening at seven of the clock, from Lady Day to Michaelmas Yearly, and at nine of the clock every evening, from Michaelmas to Lady Day yearly, and that such persons as shall then be in the said hospital after the ringing of the said bell to see the lunatics in the said hospital be delivered to depart out of the said hospital, and that no person be permitted to come into the said hospital to see any lunatics there after the ringing of the said bell in any evening, except they be persons of quality. Or governors of the said hospital, or such persons as shall come with any governor of the said hospital. In other words, hospital governors, and as you've heard, persons of quality, can gain admittance after closing time, but by implication, there's no requirement for visitors before that time to be persons of quality. A phrase I think we must understand first and foremost in terms of social class and connection, rather than principally in terms of character. Then, in 1681, prohibition on male access to the women's wards was enacted, except during daylight hours and then only in the company of female members of staff. And in 1699, a ban was introduced on the admission of anyone thought by the staff to be a lewd or disorderly liver, <clears throat> nor any young boys or girls that they think are apprentices and have no other business in the said hospital than to spend their time idly there. Of course, the potential abuses to which the practice of indiscriminate visiting was open are reflected in the character of these kind of regulations, these and others, which were made from time to time in the 17th and 18th centuries. There was no law, for instance, about, about against visitors bringing in their pet cro crocodiles with them when they come to see the patients, but you can be sure that there would have been one soon enough if they'd started doing that. The hospital may never have intended to mount what Carol Neely calls a spectacle or a tourist attraction, but its open doors effectively constituted an invitation to the general public to treat it as such if they so desired. Accordingly, in the knowledge that great riots and disorders had been committed in the hospital during the holidays at Christmas, Easter and Whitsuntide, <coughs> immediately previous, in 1764, the hospital, hospital's governors ordered that the, that the steward do provide four constables and also four stout fellows assist, or as assistants in each gallery in order to suppress any riots or disorders that might happen on Monday and Tuesday in next week. <coughs> Two years later, they decreed that for the future, the doors of Bethlehem Hospital be kept locked and no stranger permitted to come in upon the Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays next after Easter Sunday and Whit Sunday and the three succeeding days next after Christmas Day yearly. And finally, in 1770, having taken into consideration the present method of admitting persons into the hospital to visit and view the patients, and observing that great irregularities are daily committed, the patients disturbed and often robbed of their provisions and clothes by the admission of improper persons into the hospital, the governors ordered that for the future, the gates of the hospital should be kept constantly shut and that no person or persons whatsoever, except the governor or in company with the governor and the officers and servants of the hospital, 
be permitted to enter the same, unless he or she produced to the porter of the said hospital a ticket signed by one of the governors thereof, the said tickets to be provided by and delivered out of the direction of the treasurer and the committee of the said hospital. Although it took a couple of decades to iron out certain anomalies in the ticketing system that's proposed here, this decision of 1770 effectively ended the hospital's use of visiting as a revenue-raising strategy, <coughs> and for all intents and purposes took Bethlehem off the tourist trail, if we can call it that. And although I've been critical of Carol Neely, I'm grateful to her for raising the question of what it can have meant to have been on the tourist trail in 17th and 18th century London. <coughs> Her list of possible motives for visiting other than vir for voyeuristic amusement lends depth and perspective to what would otherwise be a cartoon understanding of why people came to the hospital. Remember what she said, to bring in distracted persons and take them home when recovered, to visit and provision friends and relatives there, to leave charitable donations, to examine the property of the inhabitants of the the courts of gold, old men, and perhaps also to be morally instructed. <coughs> Excuse me, my, my voice is going a bit, but we've got a video later on that will give me a rest. <laughs> <coughs> so we'll find all these motives in the accounts that people wrote of visiting Bethlehem. But we'll find spectacle and tourist attraction there as well. Remember that uh, quotation from Thomas More of uh, uh, someone banging his head against the wall and laughing? Th this is both spectacle and moral lesson uh, simultaneously. <clears throat> Yet before we launch into a discussion of these accounts, it's worth getting a sense of the scale of the phenomenon. Now this is something that's been the subject of wild speculation based on calculations derived from the fact that Annual income from visitor donations in the mid-18th century occasionally reached £400. <clears throat> that fact, and also the widespread assumption that each visitor to Bethlehem paid a penny to enter. Now, uh, you're probably faster at mathematics than I am, but this results in annual visitor numbers as of, it, of as many as 96,000. And that's the, uh, you may remember this from the Keir Waddington quotation I cited earlier. It's not bad for a hospital in a city with one-tenth of the population it has now. In fact, it's incredible for a hospital uh, in a city of that size. And I really do mean incredible, because that assumption about each visitor paying a penny turns out to be without foundation. As Patricia Aldridge, my predecessor as Bethlehem Archivist, first went into print to point out. A payment or donation was certainly required by the hospital, and a penny or two was conceivably the least sum that could be respectably offered by the poorest visitor. And I'll give an example of this later. But the amount was not fixed. And it's likely that many donations were in excess of this sum. We may recall that 10 shillings were given by the 19, 1609 show of Bethlehem people. And the Prince of Wales on a visit, visit in 1735 gave five guineas. If the average donation was one shilling, Bethlehem might have had 8,000 visitors in its bumpy years, not 96,000. Uh, but the fact is that no one can know what the average donations were or what, therefore what visitor numbers were. From the hospital's accounts, we can detect a seasonality to visitor donations and therefore all else being equal to visitor numbers. And we know that there was a high concentration of visitors and sometimes attendant problems with crowd control on religious holidays. An account published in the London newspaper The World in 1753, to which I'll later return, speaks of at least 100 people visiting at one time in one of the hospital's most busy periods, Easter week. I think this is a number which is consistent with an annual visitor total in four figures rather than in five or six. If a contemporary analogy will help you to get a handle on the numbers, I suggest we don't think in terms of the Museum of London's annual visitor figures. We think in terms of the Museum of Garden History's annual figures. Yeah? Uh, no offence meant, of course, to the Museum of Garden History, which I regard as a complete oasis of calm in South London. 
The 17th and 18th century Bethlehem wanted to attract visitors and generate revenue just like any other 21st century tourist attraction, but perhaps it did not do so on the scale that's usually imagined. Now, the architectural historian, Christine Stevenson, has speculated that the second palatial hospital at Moorfields, you can see here, was designed to attract the interest of wealthy visitors and more generally to advertise the bounty and benevolence of the great and the good of the City of London towards the poor insane. And she does so not only in her published writings, but in a film clip included in an online resource on my museum's website, which, if only for the sake of my voice, I'm now going to try and start up for you. Visitors had always been admitted to Bethlehem, even when it was in the slightly crumbling accommodation at Bishopsgate. One factor in the governor's decision to build so grandly in the 1670s, I think, was the potential of a great new building to attract well-born and charitable and wealthy visitors who might support their work. But there's no doubt that Bethlehem was on the tourist trail. We start to get guidebooks published, including in French, which is interesting, at the end of the century. And along with other sites of London, Bethlehem is regularly listed and the etiquette of visiting the hospital is described. We can imagine a visitor coming, walking down through Moorfields, this great open space in which um, there's a lot of activity. We, we read descriptions of pie sellers, people playing games, men doing something called playing at cudgels, whatever that was. And what you would see in front of you aided by the governor's decision to insert open grills into the brick wall that surrounded uh, the area, is uh, an extremely wide, uh, grand by the standards of the day building, that you would be able to register as something grand because you would see the stone carvings, the garlands, the swags, the royal coats of arms, the Bethlehem governor's coats of arms. You'd see the great statues of so-called raving and melancholy madness on top of the main gateway into the yard. You'd see the roof platforms, um, maybe not used, and certainly we hope not used by the inhabitants, but at that time connoting terrific privilege. You could walk on your roof and survey the world as a kind of master. You could see the clock. All these things people would connect with what they knew of stylish new houses, but they would understand that no house could possibly be this big. Okay, so um, I don't know if you, you noticed the uh, URL at the top there for the website. So if anyone wants to take it down, certainly if later you, anyone asks me questions I don't know how to answer, I'll refer you to this website, uh, which is part of our, website, uh, our, our uh, Archives and Museum website. And certainly, this is just one clip from it, there was extensive research sort of backing it up, both by myself and uh, Dr. Stevenson and uh, Jonathan Andrews, who I mentioned earlier. So that's definitely worth a, a, a further look. And I think we can start our survey then of the accounts of visiting Bethlehem with those who went simply to be abu amused and betrayed no trace of shame at what they were doing. In 1710, the travelling German scholar von Uffenbach arrived at Bethlehem and asked to see a patient whom he had been told crowed all day like a cockerel. The staff knew nothing about him but recommended he see another patient instead, whom they considered the most foolish and ludicrous of all, because he imagined that he was a captain and wore a wooden sword at his side and had several cock's feathers stuck into his hat. He wanted to command the others and did all sorts of tomfoolery. Von Uffenbach threw a shilling or two down to him with, what he appeared in, with which he appeared to be highly delighted, he saw other male patients with milder conditions, not mad, he said, but only deprived of their, of their wits or simple, and female patients he described as, I'm very sorry to say, utterly repulsive. All in all, a wonderful day out for the scholar. That's how he wrote it up. <laughs> and three accounts written at around the same time detail visits made in the company of children or young people, exactly the type of visit, remember, that Carol Neely found hard to credit in the 1609 example we looked at earlier. 
The following was written under the nom de plume of Isaac Bickerstaff in 1709. I am particularly observant of the temper and inclinations of childhood and youth, that we may not give vice and folly supplies from the growing generation. It's hardly to be imagined how useful this study is, and what great evils or benefits arise from putting us in our tender years to what we are fit or unfit. Therefore, on Tuesday last, with a design to sound their inclinations, I took three lads who were under my guardianship in a rambling in a hackney coach to show them the town as the lions, the tombs, Bedlam and the other places which are entertainments to raw minds because they strike forcibly on the fancy. The boys are brothers, one of 16, the other of 14, the other of 12. So some of that's a little bit unclear, but obviously he thinks it's a, it's a great day out for them and it will do them good. And the diarist Samuel Pepys and the satirist Jonathan Swift felt no need of pseudonyms when describing visits made to Bethlehem. Pepys diarising that the young people of his household went to see Bedlam in six, uh, February 1669, and Swift describing in 1710 a party which included women and children that visited first the Tower of London, where they saw all the sights, the lions, etc., then went to Bedlam, then dined at the Chop House behind the Exchange, then to Gresham College, <laughs> and concluded the night at the Puppet Show. <laughs> These extracts put me in mind of the Rough Guide to Britain's recommendations concerning the London Dungeon. It's best enjoyed by young teenagers and the credulous. In 1749, a young man named William Hutton walked to London from Nottingham, walked from uh, London from Nottingham to buy the tools he needed to work as a bookbinder. And while staying at the capital, as he later wrote, I wished to see a number of curiosities, but my shallow pocket forbade. One penny to see bed them was all I could spare. So here's one of the, the poorer sort of uh, uh, clientele customers. Here I met, here at Bethlehem, I met with a variety of curious anecdotes, for I found conversation with a multitude of characters. I never was out of the way of entertainment. So again, entertainment, uh, pure and simple. And then in a 1760 equivalent to the Rough Guide of Brit to Britain, Thomas Brown recommends a visit to Bethlehem among un other London amusements such as the Playhouse, Westminster Hall, the gaming houses and coffee houses. And he writes this, Bedlam is a pleasant place, that it is, and abounds with amusements, the first of which is the, is the building, so lately a fabric for persons wholly insensible of the beauty and use of it. The outside is a perfect mockery to the inside, and admits of two amusing queries. First, whether the persons that ordered the building of it, or those that inhabit it, are the maddest. But what need I wonder at that, since the whole is but one entire amusement? Some were preaching, and others were in full cry hunting. Some were praying, others cursing and swearing. Some were dancing, others groaning. Some singing, others crying, and all in perfect uh, confusion. A sad representation of the greater world. So these visitors seem to have considered Bethlehem to be worth a visit in an uncomplicated morally complacent sort of way. There aren't many accounts which demonstrate a greater degree of self-awareness. I think I may have found one. In 1784, the poet William Cooper wrote to his clerical friend John Newton, In the days when Bedlam was open to the cruel curiosity of holiday ramblers, I have been a visitor there. Though a boy, I was not altogether insensible of the misery of the poor captives, nor destitute of feeling for them. But the madness of some of them had such a humorous air, and displayed itself in so many whimsical freaks, that it was impossible not to be entertained. At the same time that I was angry with myself for being so. Cooper's lines are interesting because of his admission of the moral conflict within himself occasioned by a visit to Bethlehem. Perhaps this is no more than what we might expect from a poet of the English evangelical revival. But it's surprising that it wasn't more widely shared. 18th century essayists do, of course, line up to deplore the practice of visiting in general 
and the behaviour of visitors in particular. Yet the objects of their disapproval are, more precisely, all visitors except for themselves and like-minded persons of quality, whose visits are driven by higher motivations than voyeurism. A good example is the 1753 correspondent to the World newspaper I mentioned earlier, who perhaps tellingly preferred to remain anonymous. Sir, to gratify the curiosity of a country friend, I accompanied him a few weeks ago to Bedlam, a place which I should not otherwise have visited, as the distress of my fellow creatures affects me too much to incline me to be a spectator of them. I was extremely moved at the variety of wretches who appeared either sullen or outrageous, melancholy or cheerful, according to their dis different dispositions, and who seemed to retain, though inconsistently, the same passions and affections as when in possession of their reason. So you get the picture here. First, the letter writer claims that it wasn't his idea to go in in the first place, as they would be the last person to take pleasure from ogling the crazy people. And next, they start on a description of the people that he saw, of which I'll spare you most of the details, uh, and before then going on to make what they evidently considered to be a critical distinction between types of visitor. To those who have feeling minds, there is nothing so affecting as sights as these, nor can a better lesson be taught us in any part of the globe than in this school of misery. Here we may see the mighty reasoners of the earth, below even the insects that crawl upon it, and from so humbling a sight we may learn to moderate our pride and to keep those passions within bounds which, if too much indulged, would drive reason from her seat and level us with the wretches of this unhappy mansion. This, the writer says, is what is likely to make Bethlehem Hospital worth a visit for persons of quality. Yet his letter goes on, but I'm sorry to say it, curiosity and wantonness, more than the desire for instruction, carry the majority of its spectators to this dismal place. I found a hundred people at least who were suffered to, unattended, to run rioting up and down the wards, making sport and diversion of this miserable inhabitants. A cruelty which one hardly think human nature could be capable of. Surely if the utmost misery of mankind is to be made a sight of for gain, those who are the governors of this hospital should take care that proper persons are appointed to intend the spectators and not suffer indecencies to, to be committed which would shock the humanity of the savage Indians. I saw some of the poor wretches provoked by the insults of this holiday mob into furies of rage and I saw the poorer wretches, the spectators, in a loud laugh of triumph at the ravings they had occasioned. In a country where Christianity is at least professed, it's strange that humanity should, in this instance, so totally have abandoned us. So here's the proposed distinction between visitors who, like the letter writer, have feeling minds and are capable of moral education, and those who come only to mock, who are even more wretched than Bethlehem's patients not to mention the savage Indians. It's a distinction freighted with overtones of class, religion, enlightenment rationality, the loss of reason being associated with the loss of humanity, and even race, as we've seen with the savage Indian reference. And it's a distinction that, as I've said, was repeated over and over again in, by the essayists of the 18th century. So we may fairly ask whether there's anything worth rescuing in this distinction, or to put the question another way, did anyone ever learn anything of true value from a visit to Bethlehem? Or must we look askance at every account of visiting? Three quick uh, further examples to set us thinking, if I may. Uh, first of all, I'll just advance on a bit. In 1632, the clergyman Donald Lupton wrote that Bethlehem patients are put to learn that lesson which many, nay all that will be happy, must learn, to know and be acquainted with themselves, and that the hospital would be too little if all that are beside themselves should be put in here. And then in 1717, a letter writer to London's Guardian newspaper, not that Guardian newspaper, another one, wrote of those of his fellow Londoners who do not take the opportunity to donate to the city's hospitals in return for the privilege of visiting. He said, the gay and frolic part of mankind are wholly unacquainted with the numbers of their fellow creatures who languish under pain and agony 
for a want of trifle out of that expense by which those fortunate persons purchase the gratification of a superfluous passion or appetite. In other words, it doesn't cost much to go and visit your poor uh, fellow human creatures in London's hospitals. You ought to do it, and you'd be better off if you did. And then in 1743, a doctor from Lancashire by the name of Richard Kay wrote the following in his diary about his visit to London. Mr. Sparrow and I took a walk in the afternoon through the galleries at Bethlehem. Bedlam. Lord, may thy goodness to us and kind preservation of us always be had in thankful remembrance by us. Now, I appreciate that some of these lessons may seem a little remote to us, or at least some of us, insofar as they are cast in religious terms. But again, I think it's worth asking, does nothing of any value emerge from these insights, gained as they were on the strength of visiting the hospital? Was any of the visits that inspired them worth it? Or perhaps a, a contemporary analogy here is worth uh, uh, pressing. Is there anything of moral worth in the clips that show celebrities visiting development projects in third world countries that are shown on our screens as part of TV <coughs> fundraising drives? What's the relationship between our access to such scenes and our willingness to give? And is it a healthy relationship? Well, uh, I'm not going to answer those questions, but uh, as short of answering them, I, I want to indicate that the answers are unlikely to be straightforward. If a straightforward affirmation of the motives of 18th century visitors to Bethlehem was possible, presumably visiting would never have been restricted. Yet I do not think it's possible to dismiss all the published reflection about human society and human nature that arose out of those experiences as purient or patronising. Some of it undoubtedly was, but perhaps not all. Now you may be interested to hear that just as scholarly debate rages over the phenomenon of visiting, so it does over something which could be seen as a parallel to this. In her book, Regarding the Pain of Others, Susan Tontag argues against, against the commonly held view that war photography necessarily feeds anti-war sentiment in its exposure of the atrocities of conflict. Any power such images initially have to fuel moral outrage, she says, is quickly blunted by repetition uh, and actually becomes transformed into a force for moral turpitude as we become acquainted with, then inured to, and maybe even incited by images of death and violence. Now that position has been contested by others such as uh, Susie Linfield who in her recent book The Cruel Radiance argues that it is possible and indeed morally necessary to learn to see the human subjects in war photography that these people are not exploited merely by being photographic subjects, and that those who view the photographs are not brutalised merely by seeing them. All of which is a roundabout way of saying that the effect of war photography on people is complicated, because people themselves are complicated. And I think in thinking about the practice of visiting Bethlehem Hospital, we should reject simplistic binary distinctions between persons of quality and persons of none, between those with finer feelings and those without. But I think there is something authentic, something worthwhile, for instance, about the unsettling insight achieved by William Cooper into his very self following his trip to Bethlehem. It was impossible, do you remember, not to be entertained. At the same time, I was angry with myself for being so. And I say this, and in fact, I've delivered this entire lecture not to justify the practice of visiting, but to contextualise it and to assert that however much it was subject to abuse, something of moral or, and social value did occasionally come out of it. Those in the audience who have persevered with me so thus far may, may remember that I began by drawing your attention to the way in which Bethlehem had served as a ready metaphor for the various ills of English society. For hundreds of years, the things people have wanted to attribute to Bedlam have not always been a true reflection of what life is really like in, Britain, in the bricks in, and mortar institution in London. And, and, and that's the point. They weren't ever meant to be a true reflection. Instead, they have formed a plank in an argument about the nature of our politics and our society. And whether the argument has had to do with the greedy directors of the South Sea Company or the lowest common denominator uh, appeal of reality TV, 
It's an argument designed to shake people out of their moral torpor and to begin to think and care about their society. Uh, now, before I invite questions, I want to conclude by citing two examples of this kind of argument, taken from the accounts we've been looking at. Looking at. The first was written from the fictional point of view of a foreigner looking in at English society from without it in 1736. After outlining the national characteristics that tend towards madness, called uncom uh, in an uncomplimentary way by the author The English Mal Malady, and describing at length the case of one of the patients he met while visiting Bethlehem, the author turns his gaze away from Bethlehem onto the nation. Were you to see the number of English people confined for lunacy in this public hospital and the private madhouses, you would be surprised. But much more so when you observe that the actions of those who performed their usual business outside were little better than mad. In this bedlam, there are kings whose crowns and scepters are straw, and whose dominions are a dark room, and whose subjects are a million of fancies. But I must tell you, my dear friend, that there are sometimes real kings as mad as these imaginary ones, whose dominions ought to be confined to a dark room to keep them from doing further mischief. <laughs> Here are, again, numbers of people who are continually building castles in the air, but many more of these builders out of bed than they are in. This is not reportage, but it's social commentary from somewhere to the left of the Guardian, perhaps the, the real gu this, our Guardian this time. And in the interest of political balance, we should return to the anonymous correspondent in the world in uh, 1753, who from somewhere to the right of the telegraph indulges in some hand-wringing over the young hoodlums and rioters of his generation. I have frequently compared in my own mind the actions of certain persons whom we daily meet with in the world to those of the inhabitants of Bethlehem, and I know of no other difference between them than that the former are mad with their reason about them, and the latter so from the misfortune of having lost it. These former unhappy wretches are suffered to run loose about the town, raising riots in public assemblies, beating constables, breaking lamps, damning parsons, affronting modesty, disturbing families, and destroying their own fortunes and constitutions. There's not much here by way of general, not as much, I think, uh, here by way of genuine insight as we found in William Cooper. Here it's more a case of using Bethlehem as a rhetorical stick to beat your opponents with in the culture wars of the 18th century. As I've argued, this is a habit that's never really been lost. Yet I maintain that genuine insight is possible. There are currently plans for our small archives and museum at Bethlehem to become a little larger as to more adequately tell the story of mental health treatment in this country. The practice of unrestricted visiting will of course form an important part of that story and right now we're in the exhibition planning and storyboarding stage. We're toying with the idea of mounting, lifting flaps onto the walls as if to replicate the experience of the 18th century visitor peering into patients' rooms. The idea is that behind each flap will be pictures such as the ones I've shown you today, but that behind the last one in the sequence there'll be a mirror. <laughs> as if what people saw when they peeked into Bethlehem was none other than themselves. And I hope you can see that there's a real sense in which this is true. And not only true, but also valuable. If indeed Donald Lupton was right to say that the lesson which all that will be happy must learn is to know and to be acquainted with themselves. Thanks very much for listening. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.